Hello everyone, my name is James Coleman, I'm a product design graduate from the University of Brighton and a Maxwell Render Mentor and Tutor in South East England. Now today's video is going to be a bit different from what I usually do, it's going to be quite a long video, I'm going to leave some links in the description below to uh, time codes of uh, when different bits happen. And this video is inspired by a member of 3dcadjewelry.com by the name of Eric Marvitz and he found this image on my Coraflot portfolio and he liked it very much and he asked me how I made it and here we can see the full version of it and Eric was having some real trouble getting realism in his jewellery renders so that's why he asked me if I could show him how I did this render and this render in particular and you know these styles of renders do get a lot of attention so I thought it was worth making a video about them rather than uh, tell each person individually. So let's have a look at the setup. This is the setup file of the ring. It's actually a couple of years old and if I go to my perspective view you can see what I've done in this scene. First of all I've got the ring here obviously and secondly I've got this floor. Now the two things about the floor is first of all it's it's modelling or it's object and that is that it's modelled so that the extents of the floor are just outside the view of the camera. Basically they only come a tiny bit outside the view of the camera so that you're not going to get unnecessary reflections from the floor and that kind of results in it being modelled in this sort of trapezoid fashion. And this is something that has to be modelled in a 3D application. This isn't something that Maxwell can model for you. Secondly is the material on the floor and this is quite a dark material with an ND of kind of, uh, it's kind of normal for an ND, kind of plasticky. But the K value is really, really high. K value is 100. And that's really, really high for a K value. And what it does is it kind of gives you this metallic effect, despite the fact that the reflectance is quite low and the roughness is 50. The roughness is medium. So it's quite very re reflective. If I actually get rid of the K value and then change my preview to stage one, you'll see the effect that this has. There you go, without the K value it's very, very dark. And in order to um, bring back that sort of reflectiveness, pull up the K value. And basically what this is doing is making a material where it's actually quite dark. You can see here in this shade bit, it's actually quite a dark material from the reflectance zero. And it's only where there's direct lighting on it where it's really, really reflecting because the roughness is 50. If I wanted to kind of accentuate this effect, I might put the roughness down even more. And so now it's just becoming just a bit more reflective. The roughness do, does need to be a bit higher just to get that kind of effect. But the idea is that when it's used as a floor, let's change the floor preview, you're still getting a lot of highlights on areas which are directly illuminated. But where they're not directly illuminated, it is quite dark. And the idea being that when light hits it, and bounces off back towards the ring, the ring doesn't actually reflect all that much. Anyway, that's just uh, the setup of the floor material, which is kind of nice and simple, but is probably quite useful. Right, secondly is the lighting for this uh, setup, which is obviously the most important thing. And first of all, I've got this cylinder over the top. And when I say cylinder, it's not really a cylinder. It's about 180 degrees of a cylinder with the caps missing. And it's obviously only four polygons, so not very high dense mesh. And basically this is my emitter. And if I enable fire and then go to my environment and change my environment to none, you can see what this cylinder is doing. It's basically providing most of the uh, light for the diamonds and for the floor. It's not really doing a great deal to my uh, ring itself. And so for the ring, I had to bring in another type of... Uh, illumination and I went to environment and picked a nice image map. Now this image map is actually uh, an old one from Hypershot so I can't really give it out but I can show you how it works. Um, there's this very bright um, ceiling at the top and then two hotspots, one over here and one over here and you'll notice that the image is actually rotated so these hotspots are definitely aligned to the ring. And that's basically how this ring was done, a little bit of post-processing as well to uh, kind of bring out the, or just increase the contrast and increase the colour a little bit, but that's really all there was to it. I did do these couple of tests, this is actually the ring with just the environment and you can see here where the 
this black is actually coming from where the environment is hitting the um, the cylindrical emitter around and that cylindrical emitter is kind of blocking the light and you don't get this effect in via uh, preview because in fact when you deactivate the object of course you're getting rid of it completely so it's worth bearing in mind and then of course this is a nice uh, high SL version of the you know just the cylindrical emitter without the environment and of course altogether it makes this now when I was speaking with Eric about this setup he explained that he's a member of 3dcadjewelry.com and there's a lot of members on here, he said, who use Maxwell Render, but they don't really know of any kind of good setups, to, or not good, but they don't know that many, many setups that they like to use. And he said they found it difficult when they had to spend hours, you know, working on a setup just for one ring. And what they much prefer is just kind of a preset, just say this is a, a decent setup, and, you know, go with that. And he sort of gave me this challenge of coming up with a setup which could be a nice decent enough preset to just use with whatever and it's it's a thing I hear a lot of people wanting you know a preset setup just you know click and go and it's a really difficult thing to achieve but I think I may have come up with something which will at least help and so I will happily reveal it to you now this is a softbox setup and as you can see here I've got this emitter behind this plane which has a tracing paper material applied and a camera which has a very high focal length, in fact the focal length is 300mm so it's quite telescopic and it's getting rid of a lot of perspective. And in this current guise with the small emitter behind this tracing paper we're getting this sort of radial um, fall off if you like and in fact if I move this uh, emitter down a bit more and then increase its scale I get this kind of linear fall off starting light and getting dark now this is like a softbox in real life that photographers will use and what I've done is rendered out this image at a decent enough resolution to be useful and then saved it as an MXI and what I can do then is actually use this texture as an emitter and so that actually saves having to um, have this set up every single time and also what it enables me to do is to uh, kind of use this texture applied to a map and obviously applied to different surfaces which can get very very useful and this is what I've done with it Right, so these are all the different objects I've made using this material and a couple of others as well. And as you can see, I've put it into a folder and I've put it into my library folder inside my Maxwell 2.7 folder. So these objects will actually be accessible to me via in Maxwell Studio file, library, and there they all are. Although for purposes of this demonstration, I'm not actually going to pick them one by one. I'm going to just drag and drop them from Finder because it is actually faster. For me in this particular instance, not faster all the time. So let me try and explain what I've done. Basically these objects, linear 045 all the way to linear 360, are arcing lights. Now let me explain what I mean when I say that. This is what the light looks like. If I make a new camera, double click it and make it active. Then right click autofocus and fire that. You can see that this object is an arc of 45 degrees and the axis is in the center of the scene and it's got this linear emitter material applied and it's starting off light here and getting dark here and let me pick another example for example linear 180 import now in this case because I've already got uh, linear emitter material I need to, I, I want to import a new one it's going to ask me what do I want to do what I want to do is ignore the new one and then apply and with this linear emitter you can see that it is 180 degrees starting off light and getting dark and so you can probably guess what the others are they go all the way from 45 degrees to 360 degrees in 45 degree increments and of course the radial are exactly the same except guess what they're radial so these emitters start off bright in the center and get darker as they go outwards and basically what I've tried to do is make those cylinders like I had the cylinder section over the top of that ring and just apply gradient uh, emitters to them because in the real world uh, that is more likely what will be used and also it gives it just gives that a little bit more depth having 
uh, you know, a gradient uh, applied to a reflective material versus just a plain white material, which can, you know, so often just make it look flat. And now it's time to have a look at exactly how these materials are working. It's not too complicated. I'll just double click one to open it up. And in the type, type is set to HDR image. And the image is simply linear 1 watt in the case of the linear emitter and radial 1 watt in the case of the radial emitter. If any of these links get broken, what you need to do to uh, make it work again is double click it to open it up and then click this checkerboard icon and then click this little folder icon and then find either radial 1 watt or linear 1 watt. In the case of the linear emitter, um, because of the fact that obviously linear can go two ways, it can go either here to here or kind of side to side. I have included a linear 1 watt rotated emitter or material texture and obviously that's what that does, it just rotates it around 90 degrees. If you want to rotate, for example, the original one around 180 degrees, obviously what you'd have to do is rotate it. But there is a, a sort of second way of uh, getting around this and either what you can do is uh, simply rotate it around 180 degrees and then uh, 45 degrees like so. Again the axis is in the exact center of the cylinder so you can rotate it quite easily or what you can do as well which may be slightly easier or more difficult depending on your situation is to scale it. If I was to for example scale this in minus one on the Y you'll notice it disappears. Basically it hasn't disappeared but my normals have become reversed so what I need to do is flip my normals and then refresh my scene because Maxwell doesn't instantly recognize flip normals and then of course you can see that if I uh, rotate this uh, now it will be reversed it will start off light at the top and dark at the bottom and of course I can you know scale these um, uh, objects as well for example if I to scale Y up to 2 and then X up to 2 as well it's going to give me this it's basically just going to make my emitter a bit bigger these emitters, by the way, are all scaled to have a radius of 100 millimeters, which is, you know, usually works for jewelry scenes. Um, it might be a bit small, might be a bit close, but obviously that's why you can scale it up. And of course, if I wanted this particular emitter to be wider or smaller, I can do that as well. Just adjust the scale x, make it five, make it really, really wide, or make it 0.5 to make it smaller, and any and all numbers in between. But wait, there's more. In this little setup, I've included a infinity curve. Let's open up that infinity, well actually no, let's import that infinity curve. And as you can see, this infinity curve uh, starts off flat and then you've got this 45 degree angle with a nice large bevel. We'll be using that a little bit later. Let's look at what else we've got in this pack. We've got a dazzler. Let's import the dazzler and see what that is. Now this dazzler emitter, which I'm just going to move over here, this also has a texture emitter applied by the way, the infinity curve doesn't actually come with the material applied, but the dazzler emitter does come with the material applied, and it's another um, HDR image. And this time, it actually is genuine HDR image made in Photoshop. It's basically these four pixels by four pixels. The outside is a black border. The inside is white. And this is creating this effect by using tiling. So you can see, if I put my repeat in my texture picker to one, that's the uh, the texture on its own. And if I increase the repeat, you can see that that's going to act as a dazzler if I need to. And I have made it so that it's pointing downwards, basically. Um, if you want to have it pointing any other way, obviously rotate it or flip the normals or scale it or whatever you want. Whatever works, just use whatever works. One thing about this emitter, which may be useful, is obviously if you put the repeat on one to one to one uh, and the repeat on the other to more than one, you can have this sort of striped effect, which may or may not be what you're going for. But the main point of this is so it's a nice, simple, um, easily adaptable um, and tileable texture. Obviously, you could create all these white um, squares, you know, just by importing planes and cloning them. But the fact is that this setup is quite a lot faster. And again, this Dazzler material uses this 4x4 center radiance file. And if that gets broken along the way somewhere, just double click to open up the Dazzler emitter, open up the uh, image checkerboard and just load in 4x4 center. And also as well as these arcing um, emitters which I find very very useful, I've also included uh, just the linear softboxes. So I should add just the softboxes. Again, ignore the new material if you ever get that warning in this, um, in this little pack. As you can see, or as you will see when I move around, this is just um, a plane with the linear 
emitter applied. And the radial softbox is, guess what, it's just exactly the same, but with the radial material applied. So why am I showing you all of this? Well, the fact is that this will be available as a download. The SkyDrive link is in the description below. And the idea behind this pack, or this uh, idea behind this concept, is so that you can make your own setups using these kind of quite simple tools which you you know don't come with the, the default Maxwell render it had to be customized and made you'll be able to set up these scenes and then save them and again the idea is to save these setups inside this uh, pack folder so that they're accessible from your library and speaking of I have an example scene which I would like to show you now okay so here's my example scene that I've included with this file or should I say included with this um, pack and as you can see there's my example ring here just a simple gold ring sort of with these two edges kind of coming together kind of Mobius-esque I liked it anyway um, and a diamond in the top and I've just got these three emitters here and again these are all sort of made using if not exactly the same um, files um, then the same techniques and the same approaches but actually these um, these objects, I should say, uh, were not made from what I've given in the file because they're just, it's basically just a size thing. Um, I've used 45 degree increments in the um, in the file pack, so these, you know, this obviously isn't 45 degrees, and these were actually modelled kind of individually. However, of course, you know, it's a very, very easy shape to make in Rhino, um, and assuming the UV works properly, then it should be okay. I might, uh, you know, if there's if there's call, if there's if there's need for uh, more increments, you know, 15 degree degree increments or whatever, then I'll quite happily make them. But anyway, enough blabbling. Um, let's get on with this setup. So these three lights. This is my right light that I've called, which is providing all of these nice reflections here and this is a radial emitter. I have a linear emitter down here in my under light I've called it and this is for this reflection here and finally I have a dazzler which is up here which is providing the dazzle obviously and just to show you exactly what effects they're giving this is the under light which I said is providing this here and then there's the right light which is these reflections here kind of most reflections and then finally there's the dazzler which is providing this nice dazzle here there is quite a bit of, um, I don't want to say unwanted, but it is unwanted really. There's a, there's a lot of reflection here from the Dazzler, but never mind. And basically this is what this uh, pack is meant for, which is kind of quickly putting together, I mean, this is only three lights and it's kind of producing a very, very nice effect. And then the idea is that obviously without this ring, you know, you delete the ring and then save this MXS file in your library and keep it as a setup to use in the future which you can just import into your rings so that's exactly what I tried to do and now I've got some examples of how things turned out this ring here was made using exactly the same setup as the uh, previous example and you know it's worked out quite nicely it's worked out quite well because the fact that all rings will have roughly the same geometry so this approach can work and basically the workflow would be to open up the uh, lighting setup from the library and then to import the ring so that you get um, you know the the camera and the environment settings in the uh, in the template and just to prove that this uh, setup is using exactly the same setup as the previous ring here is proof here is indeed the uh, the setup and this is literally exactly the same thing I've got my under emitter here and my right light and my dazzler and just a word on the dazzler um, the dazzler in this case is uh, and in the pre in the actual uh, template as well, I should say the example. It's not the Dazzler texture that I showed earlier. This is literally just a plain white emitter. Um, I could use the Dazzler texture if this wasn't good enough. And also one more thing, important thing to point out is the fact that this is uh, positioned kind of very very near to the right light. And obviously, if these two were actually overlapping, that would be bad news. So in other words, this has a radius of 100, so the distance from the surface to the centre is 100 millimetres, and this has a radius of 99, so just to make sure they're not overlapping. If they were overlapping, you would see it. It would be obvious in the ring reflections that something was wrong. Here's another ring with a sort of kosh surface on the top, uh, just going all the way around it. And this, again, is using a very, very similar style to the uh, previous setups. 
in this case it's actually just one right light and this is actually um, a pure white this has no texture applied and then this emitter here has a linear texture applied so again very simple and very similar this ring here again was very very similar to the example scene that I've used except that there was no dazzler because there's no diamonds on this ring so there was no need to have a dazzler so uh, in order for proof here you can see I've got the right light with my radial emitter, my under light with the linear emitter, but there's no dazzler in this scene. And this, uh, again a Kosh surface ring, this was made not with the uh, example setup, but just while I was experimenting with the idea of it. And so I'll show you this setup. Here you've got two emitters, uh, one above and one below, and this is the camera view here. And then this uh, emitter on the left hand side. And again, these are all with a linear emitter applied. So all of these gradients here are as a result of the linear emitters. Now, there is a risk, obviously, this one it, it can look fake quite easily just because it's so simple. Um, I have tried to, you know, obviously there are chamfers added um, which helps bring in the realism and there's a depth of field which increases the realism and the ring is reflecting itself which again increases the realism. But when you look at this, sometimes it does look just look like a, an illustrator file and that's just as a consequence of the job, really. There's not much you can do about that you may want to bring in some anistropy and you know small scratches and things like that to kind of increase the realism but that's not really a great deal to do with the lighting which is why I'm here today another one that I'll just quickly show you is this setup here it's not particularly fascinating but um, it's while I was experimenting with this idea so I'll just show you that quick so this is the setup for this ring and this large cylinder overhead is just an ordinary emitter and that's providing the dazzle but these um, these planes here they have a linear emitter material applied I'll just quickly uh, go into the camera view and show what these are doing so if I turn off the left and right there's the dazzle coming from the top cylinder and also some quite bright reflections there and just to kind of in introduce some more S subtle, slightly smaller reflections. There's the, um, the left and right emitters, but obviously they do nothing for the ring, which is why that uh, overarching dazzler has to be there. Okay, so there you go. There's proof that this setup does look quite good when applied to other rings as well. It's not just uh, completely custom to this to this ring, particular ring. There are more things to cover in this particular setup, but we've been going for quite a while now, so pause the video, go away, have a cup of tea, or whatever it is that you do, and then come back and we will continue. Right, hello everyone, and welcome back after your cup of tea, or whatever you had. Um, I had so much tea, I changed my t-shirt. Boom boom. Now, uh, the next little chapter in our epic journey of getting this jewellery set up half decent is different ways of getting the white background now there's loads of different ways to actually do this and I'm going to show you uh, pretty much all of them <laughs> or at least all of the ones I know um, and certainly obviously the ones which I recommend um, there are various different methods and basically it all boils down to do you want a little subtle shadow underneath your jewellery or objects or do you want a little subtle reflection uh, if you don't and you just want a white background then uh, it's nice and easy nice and fast uh, not just to set up but also to render uh, if you do want a subtle shadow or a subtle reflection it may be a bit slower to render and maybe even a bit slower to set up but that is entirely your decision. Uh, all I'm here to do is tell you how to do it. I'm not here to tell you what to do, really. That's up to you. So, without further ado, let's have a look at uh, the setup I've got here. This is basically the preview scene in the example setup one, which comes with this absolutely free pack, which I have so lovingly made for you. And all it is is the environment. And basically, this setup takes a while to kind of get used to it in terms of it takes a while to set up maybe and then once it is set up you've kind of got to think uh, well not got to think why it works but just um, appreciate the fact that it does work and it might take a while to kind of get your head around these settings but once it's done it's done and obviously in this example setup it's done for you so let's have a look at the settings okay so in my environment window my type is set to image based my sky dome is a constant dome 
of intensity of 3000 candelas per square meter. The zenith and horizon are RGB 245, 245, 245. They're both exactly the same. My midpoint is 45 degrees, however, this midpoint doesn't actually mean anything because the zenith and horizon are exactly identical, which means that this midpoint doesn't do anything. Well, moving on down, my sun does not exist. I do not have a sun, at least not in this scene. Now, my IBL settings. My background channel is set to active sky. So in other words, it's using this, the constant dome. That is why I can see pure white in the background because my background is set to active sky. My active sky is pure white with intensity of 3000. My reflection, refraction and illumination channels are disabled. There is nothing, at least in the environment settings, which is uh, acting as a reflection, refraction or illumination. And that is the one of the quickest and easiest ways to get an absolutely white background. The things to consider are the fact that obviously you can't have um, things visible, as I uh, think I've already mentioned, you know, these um, under lights, for example, in the object parameters, this is set to hidden from camera. If this wasn't enabled, then you'd see it. If I turn on my fire window, you will see it. Exactly, there you go. And I have to hide that from the camera. It's still uh, visible to the reflections and refractions and the illumination. However, my camera can't see it, which is why it's kind of looking through that under light and seeing the background behind it. The only other thing you've got to worry about in these sky settings is the intensity value. Now, my camera is currently set to EV9, and that's kind of what I recommend for interior style uh, setups, you know, like this, 9, maybe 8, you know. You might want to go to 7 or 10, but really and truly you want to be around you know, 8.5, give or take. Um, I usually give to 9, because, because. And then in my environment, my intensity is 3000. This is not a number I plucked out of the sky. Basically, I started with you know, 100 or even 1,000 or, you know, whatever it started with and basically get a little bit higher each and every time and even at 2,000 it's still grey and then 3,000 is finally white. Now, I don't need to go much above 3,000, obviously I could put this at you know, 100,000 and be safe in the knowledge that it's definitely white. However, I usually set it at just enough to be pure white just in case it leads to problems later on. You don't want overkill, you don't want more than necessary. And that is the first method of achieving a pure white background, and this is good because it gives a preview of the white literally in the fire window. However, it does require the somewhat complicated environment setup, type IBL, sky to constant dome, pure white at the appropriate intensity, background type set to active sky and reflection, refraction and illumination set type to disabled. And now I'm going to have a look at a second way to achieve a pure white background. Okay, so to prove that my environment is not actually having an effect on this scene anymore, what I'm going to do is actually turn my environment off, set my environment type to none. Now, immediately the background goes black. There's no other changes to the scene. Remember, though, there's you know, nothing else has changed, nothing else is different. In my render options, all I'm going to do is make sure that my channel's output mode is set to embedded. This is the important bit and then enable my alpha channel, okay? Now, what's going to happen when I render is that, surprise, surprise, my alpha channel is going to be embedded into my image. Let me show you what that looks like. Okay, here's my render rendering along nicely, and down here in the bottom left of, of the uh, view, you've got R and A. R stands for render channel, and that's the technically the diffuse and reflection pass, and then underneath that is A, and A stands for alpha, I'm just going to let this get a little bit up uh, in render time and like the previous method, this method is actually very, very fast in render time because there's nothing uh, physically modelled you know, underneath, there, there is no floor. The moment you put floors, and by floor I mean F-L-O-O-R, not F-L-A-W, into the scene then render time can get a bit high. Because there's nothing behind the ring, it's showing up as black, it's literally not seeing anything. Not only is it not seeing anything, it's you know literally seeing it onto infinity. Therefore, in the alpha, we see the things in the scene, i.e. the ring, as white and the background as black. And because this is embedded, we can actually open, well, if we save using a, um, a format which embeds alphas, we can open this in other applications and surprise surprise the alpha will be embedded and that's exactly what we're going to do. Now that it's up to SL7 I'm going to stop that 
and save this image as a ping. Remember to save it as a ping uh, .png format. Uh, save this and then open it up in Photoshop and we will go on from there. Okie dokie, here we are in Photoshop and bear in mind that all I've done is opened up the ping. This is not the MXI opened up in Photoshop, although you can do that as well if you want. However, in this instance I don't actually recommend it unless you're going to do more post work to it. Bear in mind that this method does involve opening up the image in Photoshop, which is, I understand, yet another step compared to having a pure white background to start with. However, with these renders, you are going to open them up in Photoshop and do something to them. Please bear that in mind. You know, don't just render something and then save it and publish it wherever. Do do something to it in Photoshop. It might be auto contrast, you know, image auto contrast. At the end of the day, that's something. Don't do nothing to it. But what I'm going to do to this is make a new layer, pop my layer underneath my ring, and literally just fill it with white. That's all I'm going to do. This is definitely white because it's white. And fill it with white. And there we go, white background. Easy as that. Now, because of the fact that this was uh, rendered with an embedded alpha, there is another step we have to do. And that's with the render layer selected. So not this white layer I've just made. With the renders layer selected, the original ring. Go to Layer matting and remove black mats. You may not see a great deal of difference uh, but it will remove a slightly dark fringe which you get around uh, images when they're made using this style. So remove black mat and if I zoom in a little bit and basically just keep an eye on these borders you will see that uh, before and after you do see a slight change. Now the the rest of the black you know around the outer edge of the ring is uh, due to the fact that it's not actually reflecting anything uh, it's not due to the mat but um, it will be you know, the black mat will be a lot more prevalent and obvious in scenes where you do have reflections there and where it's not black just because it's black and that is the second method of getting uh, a pure white background right the third method of uh, getting a pure white background and first of all of course I'm gonna turn off my alpha layer and and yep that's it turn off my alpha layer um, all I'm going to do is literally just place an emitter behind the scene it sounds really simple and it is really simple um, and basically that's just going to provide the the white light that I need so basically I'm just going to quickly fire this just to prove that environment settings still aren't on that underlight still thinks it can be hidden from the camera. I promise you it can't. Right. And so in the environment settings there's nothing there and um, this scene is black as far as uh, this render is concerned. Now what I'm going to do is literally just place uh, an emitter behind uh, the scene here and um, use that as my white background. So all I'm going to do is File, Library, Objects, Primitives, Plane 1 by 1, Import, and then it's just a case of uh, scaling this around and moving it into position so that it's kind of in the view behind your scene, you know, well far away enough it's not interfering with anything in the scene and um, in the view of the camera and again you only just want it in the in the extent of the, you'll see what I mean when it's done uh, but I'm gonna do that while you do something else because this is quite laborious and boring. Hello and welcome back and what you missed was me just positioning this plane so that it is where I said I'd put it, um, just kind of in the view of the camera, uh, just enough if I go to my camera view, it is literally kind of just extending out the side of this view so it's definitely filling the frame and all I've done is positioned it with the Y towards the um, camera so that the light will be emitted out of this side and assigned an emitter and the emitter uses the Lux luminance mode with an output of 9000 and it is as simple as that, just to give us the uh, the white background. Um, and there we go, that is the third method of getting the uh, pure white background. The trouble is with this method is that you might get uh, some reflections in, the, in your objects in the scene. And for example, if I turn off this emitter, you'll see that this uh, large area of the, not large area, but this area of the ring has a large reflection on it. So if I turn on the emitter again, you can see that it's being reflected here. That's not necessarily a bad thing. You might like that, and um, you know, uh, you might have an emitter kind of placed there anyway. But just bear that in mind that um, that kind of thing 
can and does happen, obviously. Uh, one potential way around this, of course, is to go to your object parameters and make the, uh, the plane that you've positioned here hidden from reflections and refractions. That's going to go and get rid of that. And if you hide it from global illumination as well, of course, it's not going to provide any illumination to the scene, which, again, you may actually want that. Just don't hide it from the camera because then it's not going to do its job. So that is uh, practically the same approach, actually, as um, you know, using the environment, except that this is, well, for one, it needs a plane that actually positions there. Um, and secondly, maybe it is a little more customizable because, you know, you could put something else there. Um, a textured emitter, for example. But uh, that's it. That's the third method. On to the next. And speaking of the next, the next method actually requires us to have a floor. And again, this is F-L-O-O-R. So, uh, all I'm going to do actually is to uh, just remove that material from that object, show it in the refractions a little bit of motion again, and uh, literally just reposition it. Okay, and we're back again, and as you can see, all I've done is put a little, well, just move the existing plane into position as a floor. And again, you know, this is rotated so that it's just uh, within the camera, extends and scaled, uh, so it's not going to kind of interfere with the rest of our scene. Speaking of interference, you can already see here that, you know, this, this ring is showing up in the reflections and obviously if I turn off the plane from refraction reflections that's not going to happen however you know um, that might cause issues because of the fact that your audience isn't stupid they can tell that there's something a bit weird in this scene and in this case it's the invisible floor or well, not strictly speaking invisible but uh, just you know not showing up quite properly now assuming that you want your floor to be plain white uh, of course what you have to do is make a new material and what you're going to want to do, uh, if I just change the preview to floor and refresh, obviously this is grey, which is you know this grey material we get at the moment. If you don't believe me, there actually is the material on the object, and the material appearance hasn't changed. Um, now, of course, what you want is not pure white. Um, the highest white that we should go in Maxwell is traditionally 225 in the reflectance zero and the roughness down at 95 because otherwise you can get a lot of noise in your scene. In my personal experience I have pushed it up to RGB 245 and roughness 100 in cases where it hasn't particularly mattered and it's 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 worth it. Uh, so please by all means don't do just what I say. Please experiment for yourselves. It is worth it. However in this example I'm going to play it safe and play it by the book so I'm going to go for reflectance zero of 225 on the V, because I use HSP, or, or 225 in RGB, and then a roughness of 95. Now you can already see the problem. Um, this material is as white as it should go, and the background doesn't appear white, but the rest of our scene is correctly exposed for this ring. So what are we going to do? What we're going to do is a little trick, which is going to increase the exposure of the floor without affecting the rest of the scene. And I hear you cry, but James, how can we do such a thing? I'll show you. Over here in your render channels, enable the material ID or the object ID. What I'm going to use in this case, in this case I'm going to use the material ID. You can actually do this kind of either way, material or object. Whichever you have less of, you should do it. If you have less materials than objects, use the uh, material. If you have less objects than materials, use the object, because it's going to be faster. Um, in this case, I'm going to go with materials, because I've only got three materials in this scene that's kind of visible to the camera. However, obviously, I only have three objects as well, so it doesn't actually matter. Material is usually what I'd go for, because then I can kind of bring other things in, other objects, but the same material without having to redo or, you know, add, you know fiddle with the trick. Okay, so then in my materials, just going to double click to open up the materials. Go to the material properties. In the material ID of the floor material, I'm going to change it from default, whatever it may be, to pure white RGB 245, 245, 245, or HSV 00, 245. Okay. Then in the other materials, for example, gold, gold ring, 
material properties. I'm going to change the material ID to pure black 000. And in the diamond, again, same thing, material properties. So yeah, diamond, same thing, material ID, material properties. And set it to black 000. And then, with your material ID enabled and those materials with their uh, correct material IDs applied, again for the floor you want white and for everything else you want black. Okay. Then render that out and here is one I made earlier of what you will get. And similarly to the alpha trick you kind of get your default render but also you have this now this looks like an alpha, but it's not. It's kind of a fake alpha using this trick. And it helps us a lot when we open this image in Photoshop. And speaking of opening this image in Photoshop, what you want to do is open this MXI in Photoshop. So again, you know, you'll need Photoshop with the Photoshop plugin. Um, and open the MXI. Don't just open the image if you want to save it. There's the Save MXI dialog. Save it in you know, a name that you know somewhere safe. And then open this image, this MXI, in Photoshop. Okie dokie, and here is what you will get. Now, don't particularly worry about kind of what it looks like because I had multi light enabled. Basically, um, uh, the MXI saves every single emitter as a different layer, and this in helps me to actually kind of uh, keep the multi light feature. So, for example, you know, uh, this is just the emitter on the right. Please note uh, as well that these layers are named not by the object name but by the material name. So you've got to kind of have your wits about you and remember that this is the emitter over here. You can blatantly see it as due to the reflection and then this is the dazzler obviously still working nicely there and finally this is the uh, the emitter providing these reflections um, and you know it is kind of uh, affecting the ground quite a bit and there's yeah, quite a lot of gold material uh, maintained in the diamond. Mm, we may need to get rid of that. I um, hadn't really noticed it before but there we go. Anyway, what I'm going to do is actually uh, ignore those layers and just focus on the top layer which is the combination of, of everything. And if we look down here, this is my extra ID material and what I do if I hide... actually no, I don't need to hide all of those. Just bring it up to the top and have a better look at it. Um, it's nothing special, obviously. We knew what it looked like already. The floor is white, the ring is black. What I'm going to do is, with my marquee selection tool, is Command or Control A to select everything, and then Command or Control C to copy it. Then I need to hide that layer. And what I'm going to do is add myself an exposure adjustment layer. And then what I'm going to do is with the alpha of the or the mask of the exposure adjustment layer selected go to my channels and then make the exposure one mask visible and make sure it's selected as well and then command or control V to paste in the mask which I made out of faking a material ID or faking the mask using the material ID then hide that mask again go back to your layers and then select the properties of the exposure adjustment layer and with the exposure bump it up to however much you need to get your white background. Now again this is fake, it is a con, it is a trick. Your viewer might realize it however in my experience the viewer is guess what looking at the ring. The viewer accepts that the background is the background is going to be pure white. If they even notice a subtle little shadow, it would surprise me. Because of the fact that the, the only reason this works is because it's a 32 bit layer, so the exposure is real. Um, this technically does work in 16 or 8 bit, but it's not as accurate. And again, you know, these reflections here are not being changed. Now, if I put this up or down or do whatever I want with it, uh, these reflections are not changing in intensity so again you know, that's just uh, evidence and proof if you like that this is a, a con artist trick that this isn't really working properly although despite the fact that it doesn't really work uh, properly kind of doesn't magically make the floor white it does make the background white enough to you know, pass as a, a real background and like I said, I'm not here to tell you which method to use, I'm just here to tell you which methods there are. So that is method number four.
Now the trouble is, this is still in 32-bit format, and if you want to save it, if I go to File, Save As, and Now, you'll see that it's only in formats which support 32 bits. If I want to save it as a JPEG or a PNG or whatever, I need to go to Image, Mode, and 8 bits per channel. It's going to ask me, do you want to merge or not? Again, experiment with both. If you say don't merge, then your appearance will change slightly because now, you know, technically it's adjusting the exposure of an 8-bit image. But if I kind of go back and forward between the two states, the actual difference is negligible, in fact, in, in my humble opinion. But be aware that if you do choose to merge your channels, make sure that you set your method to exposure and gamma and leave the values at their default 0 and 1. All of the other methods are designed for HDR photography where the goal is to maintain the highlight and shadow detail. We don't want to do that. Personally, I think sometimes you can choose don't merge and get away with it. But that is method four. Okay, method number five is uh, kind of very much like method number four in that it involves a flaw, but um, this time I'm going to treat the flaw a little bit differently. And instead of using any tricks to get the background I want, I'm just going to uh, do it in the render. Hopefully. Well, big hopefully. Okay. So the first method is uh, to actually uh, make an AGS material. So I'm going to double click my floor material that I'm currently using and go to Wizards and AGS and just go with, uh, well, I just want a slight reflection, so, you know, maybe 10%. And then I'm going to set my type to clear and say OK. And then just, you know, 2 for 5 on the uh, colors. And there we go. Now, on the one hand, obviously, you know, this is um, not good. Uh, but if I put my environment back on, you can see that now it is, um, it is white. However, I may have lost the... Um, the effect of having the AGS floor that I wanted. So what I might do is, uh, in the opacity mask of this uh, specular BSDF layer, just pop that up. Basically, this is the um, the amount of reflection. So 50 is a bit too much. And again, you know, just fiddling with this to get the effect you want. You can obviously see the downside already of using this technique is that you do um, because what's happening with the light is that you know it's going through this AGS material is that um, you do get quite a lot of noise basically um, just got to live with it um, or let it get to a high enough SL that it's not really noticeable to the naked eye to an untrained eye uh, but it does give you um, this effect of having a very very subtle um, uh, very very subtle reflection and it is you know sometimes sometimes it is just enough to ground the object that you're trying to render and just kind of uh, make it look like it's not uh, hovering in midair it is just subtle enough Okay, another material that you can apply to the floor plane to kind of make it look, uh, you know, again, the white background effect, if, it's, if I just make a new material, because it's easier to start from scratch on this one. Again, I'm going to make my reflectance 0 to on uh, HSV00225, uh, as, as white as I want to go. But then what I want to do is change my roughness to 50. And if I just preview that, you can kind of see uh, kind of middle grey material that I'm getting. What I'm going to do is actually put my K up to 100. Now, K is not a percentage. It can go higher than 100, but you know, 100 is just a nice round number to remember. And also, K is much more sensitive than um, than going to 100. You know, I could go a lot lower. I could probably go to 5 or 10, and it would get the same effect. But 100 is just kind of making sure. And then refresh that, and you well, you may not be able to see in the preview, but uh, it is subtly different. And basically, it's now very reflective in a kind of way. If I apply that material to my floor, you should see, I mean, this uh, reflection here is kind of coming from the 50% uh, roughness, but also because it's not that diffuse, it means it's reflecting a little bit more light. Now, obviously, this isn't reflecting enough light to uh, give me a white background. I could use my Material ID trick, and speaking of, uh, just turn off that material ID so I'm not rendering unnecessarily. But what I am going to do, uh, which is related to both this technique and the next, in fact, is just to um, blow out this uh, environment, uh, sorry, not the environment, the floor, using a uh, another emitter. And the reason that this material actually kind of 
uh, lends itself to this effect is because of the fact that it uses a roughness of 50 instead of a nice, you know, high roughness, high diffuse roughness like Line T5. This will actually kind of help this effect by reflecting more light. So all I'm going to do is clone this object and literally just uh, move it back slightly. Again, you know, you just want this like that. Go to my rotate tool, hold down shift, rotate it by 90 degrees. Again, just moving it in place, and then what I'm going to do is actually apply uh, an emitter material. And after I've applied this emitter material, obviously uh, my scene is going to change quite dramatically. I might uh, scale this emitter again somewhat. So pop that onto there, like so. And of course, predictably, you know, I'm getting massive reflections and etc. 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 This is the downside of this technique: is obviously it is affecting the lighting in your scene. Um, it is nice and realistic, but you know. Um, and when I say it's realistic, I mean it's a, it's a realistic technique as opposed to a, a realistic render. Um, obviously, all the renders try and be realistic, but um, this is a uh, realistic technique that will be used in photography of uh, using uh, a slightly reflective floor as opposed to just a plain old diffuse floor to kind of get that get that light. And again, all I can really do now is minimise these reflections rather than eliminate them entirely and maybe just uh, pop up. the intensity of this light until I get the white background that I want. What you can do is kind of get a bit more elaborate, uh, kind of, you know, moving this uh, plane up here. And again, this is a more of a full-blown studio technique, which is kind of not why I'm here. This is kind of getting a bit complicated now. And that's kind of my point, that this is another approach, but not necessarily the one you want to use. And then what I would uh, personally, you know, if I was doing this scene, I wouldn't do this technique, but because um, it just you know, it does take a while. But um, is you can put another plane in here, actually as a black plane. Again, this is going kind of harks back to photography where they will deliberately put black card or just black objects um, to block the light and help add in the contrast in your scene again. But hopefully you can see that uh, you know the effect that uh, this is giving. You know it is now nice and white at the top of this um, at the top of this uh, fire preview, which is now stalled. So let me stop and start it again. And you know I could probably again just scale this slightly. And you know, the bigger it is, the more it's going to show in the ring, and basically it's just a compromise. But hopefully you can see the effect it's giving. And I mentioned that you know, this material is deliberately at a roughness of 50, uh, just so that um, it helps this effect. I can put this up to a roughness of 95 so that it is more diffuse. However, you can hopefully see that the effect is lessened if I do that. And of course, you know, I don't have a a reflection in the floor anymore. I just kind of have this um, this yellow here isn't really a reflection. You know, this material is diffuse. End of story. And all that's really um, happening here is this. This is just indirect uh, lighting coming from the emitter over on the left hand side, bouncing off the ring and then onto the floor and then into the camera. A true reflection would be you know near a roughness of 50, where you know this is genuinely a reflection of the ring uh, and not just indirect illumination. A slight variation on using a floor with a emitter directed to it is this approach. Now this is using the uh, infinity plane or the infinity curve which I demoed earlier. And as you can see from my setup I've got the infinity curve here and I've sort of rotated it to be in, uh, in line with the camera and scaled it so that it's uh, not too wide uh, so that it's kind of blocking a lot of the scene. It's just wide enough so that the camera uh, just can't see the edge there. And then I've got an emitter here which is directing light downwards onto the infinity curve and which is then kind of helping to bounce back from the infinity curve onto this floor here. And again this will be a real world technique that real world photography will use which is why I need to apply it into Maxwell. What the infinity curve will also help me to do is that if I want to angle my camera so that I'm actually kind of angled at a bit more of an acute angle down onto my scene, I can do that 
and if I kind of accidentally go too far, or not too far, but as far as I want to go, and I get the horizon in the view, or if I just kind of uh, get a really, really shallow angle, the infinity curve obviously curves up, that's the point of it, and it doesn't have to be as big as a floor plane. And hopefully you can see in this uh, window, although obviously the lighting is now completely haywire, that the infinity curve is uh, still visible when a floor or a single plane would have to be really, really big in order to be visible at the extent of the scene, you know, especially if you took it to extreme angles where the horizon is in the view. And now technically, if this was a simple plane, you would still be able to see the horizon infinitely far away. However, when an infinity curve, I can scale it up. And although I would still have to fiddle and adjust the lights in this scene, Hopefully you can see that the infinity curve will be visible despite the fact that a floor would go on to the horizon into infinity in this case. Maxwell Render does come with an object in the object library called Studio, which is similar to this, but with the studio, the floor and the back wall are at 90 degrees. In this case, the floor and the back wall are at an angle of 45 degrees and the chamfer is a lot smoother. And yet again, this is just another trick to try and get that pure white background, in this case with a subtle shadow. And speaking of the subtle shadow, it's worth mentioning that the material I've actually used on this floor, just to prove a theory or prove a point, the material is actually 255, 255, 255, and the roughness is 100. Now, strictly speaking, you shouldn't use a material like this, but it's worth trying out to see if you get too much noise. You know, it's a personal opinion thing but it may help you to get a pure white background, but just don't take my word for it, do some tests. If this results in a lot of noise, which it may well do, especially in jewellery scenes, then turn rough reluctance zero down to HSV 00225 and pop the roughness down to 95. Okay, it's time to move on, <laughs> finally, to the last method of uh, getting a plain white background. And this one I'm actually going to use the uh, materials I have in this scene, and all it is really is an emissive floor, and it is as simple as it sounds. I'm just going to apply this emitter material to my floor and then adjust my emitter material like I did before. I mean, 9000 uh, worked, and obviously, this is very, very similar to um, the technique where you had an emitter behind the camera, but now it's literally underneath the object rather than just behind the camera. Technically, this is in effect uh, used in real life photography. So, um, you know, you will have a light box uh, and then your object on top of the light box to get that plain white background. As a result, it, yes, it does kind of give you massive great reflections, but because it's a it's a technique that's really used, your audience knows that and they kind of see these objects and they see these massive reflections and they just kind of accept them. And it can actually help, you know, it's it's an imperfection which helps it look real. Um, because your audience is familiar with jewellery photography where these techniques are used. So they see this and they think it's a photo because that's what you get in a photo. The audience, the, 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 photographer, blah, blah, the photographer knows that it's a, a flaw, you know, a problem, a mistake. However, the audience doesn't know that. <laughs> so uh, what you get is a mistake and something that shouldn't be there but the audience thinks that it should which is kind of unusual and again you know this is just a case of uh, honing in the um, the value but again you know, 9000 is what I actually want to use obviously in this case it is blowing out the ring um, quite badly but at different angles I, I promise you that this technique works I, I promise you it does okay that brings to the end our little uh, this this chapter of the video God knows how long it is by now. And those are all of your methods of getting the white background, depending on if you want a subtle uh, reflection or a little bit of shadow, whatever. But in a nutshell, that is what they are. Another method of lighting, which you may have heard of, or you may have tried in the past, whatever, um, is called high dynamic range lighting, or high dynamic range imaging, uh, environment lighting, whatever you call it. Um, in Maxwell, it's in the environment window with your type set to image based. And uh, basically, in your background map, you load up the image you want to use, the high dynamic range image you want to use, and in the reflection, refraction, and illumination channels, set the types the same as background, so it definitely uses this. And then also, you'll note that my offset is adjusted 
Um, this, and I'll explain this a bit later. Anyway, what this is in short is if I go to my perspective view, is, as you can see around my scene, which is now consisting of just the ring and the floor, uh, is this image which is being used to provide uh, environment illumination to my scene. And uh, as you can see, there's no other objects in the scene, uh, there's no other lights. All of this lighting is being provided by this image. Now I mentioned this um, offset, which is 21, and what this offset does is basically rotates this image around, because basically I don't uh, choose to have this offset. So, you know, by default it's it's here, and I know that uh, this is basically this image basically um, imitates a photographic light box, and the camera, which you know in this view is obviously here, kind of in line with the uh, object looking down, has to be aligned with this dark space, and basically this is just uh, adjusted so that it's um, in line. But the big question is, um, are they worth it? Uh, Obviously, it's a lot easier to just uh, you know load up a single HDRI and illuminate your scenes. However, as you can see, the effect you get may not be worth it. Um, and certainly, at least you know in in this scene, I'll need to import a dazzler to use as my dazzler emitter on my diamond. Um, however, in general, you know, is this scene worth it? You know, you've got some weird artifacts or textures going on here, and it's just a bit odd all round. Um, and again, this material which I've used on my floor is, or should be, technically white, but again it's not white, so I'd have to fiddle around and get it to be white. If I wanted to use, you know, while I'm here I'll just explain that, if I wanted to use my um, uh, background trick to make my background white, what I can do is uh, hide, or just deactivate the plane one by one. And again, uh, in my sky settings, it set it to constant dome like I did before with uh, intensity of uh, 3000 which worked uh, before but this time what I need to do is actually set my reflection refraction and illumination to this HDRI so what I need to do is copy and paste this map address and then paste it in to all these individual channels and then make sure that my offset is the same as well 23 and this has again just is manually each and every one. And then change my background type to active sky. And there we go, that is using the HDRI for my uh, reflection, 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 and illumination. And my background is my sky dome, which is giving me the white effect. Again, you know, this obviously doesn't help the dazzler issue or the, um, the other weird reflections in the scene. But for something really, really quick and dirty, uh, HDR lighting can be something. But, of course, you're probably asking, where can you get some decent HDRI as well? You can make them yourself in Photoshop. Um, I can't really go into how or why, because it's a, it's a long-winded kind of thing. Uh, but you can get at least some uh, online for free and, you know, legitimately use them. And here is... Uh, a user by the name of Zibig uh, on DeviantArt, and despite the fact that these sets are quite old, um, they are still, you know, definitely worth uh, trying out. There's three sets: one, two, three, and as you can see, you know, these are definitely download, modify, share, put them to good use, um, and they are worth it. Uh, and I will pop the addresses of these in the description below and uh, of course my huge thanks to Zibig for providing this uh, content it is still some of the best out there and certainly some of the best uh, free stuff you can get other HDRIs you know studio HDRIs uh, online but they are quite difficult to come by um, there is HDR light studio which enables you to make some yourself although I have uh, used it in the past and I didn't stay with it because of the fact that you know it was another step to do and basically um, the really really basic HDRIs I found myself making were not that different so um, I personally didn't find it worth it although it is uh, certainly an option uh, and again you know you can make very very simple basic HDRIs in uh, Photoshop which are you know enough to get you by basically if this kind of uh, approach appeals to you. It is now time to move on to a uh, just a few more settings inside um, Maxwell Render and just kind of pre-flight checks, if you will, or pre-render checks. 
Okay, hopefully you've got your scene set up now, and I just want to go through a couple of uh, the render options just to make sure that everything's hunky-dory before rendering it off. So in the render options window at the top of the scene, I've got my time set to 9 and a 9 because it's going to render, you know, maximum render is going to go until it reaches either the time limit or the sampling level. And I want it to definitely stop when it reaches the sampling level. I don't want it to surrender for, say, 10 minutes but not go to the sampling level I want. So I tell time to 9 and a 9. It's not actually going to render for that long. It's going to render until it reaches the sampling level. In this case, it's 25. Again, that's way too high. I'll usually go to 16 is a kind of normal uh, render. 18 is a nice render, especially when you're doing jewellery. Maybe even for some jewellery, go up to 20 because it will take that much. If you're still seeing a lot of noise at, you know, at these levels, especially 18 or 20, there may be something wrong with the scene. Um, there shouldn't be any noise at 18 or 20. Well, there, uh, there may be some, but it shouldn't be like all over the place. Um, while we're here, you know, 10 is about a draft. 8 or 10 is about a draft. Uh, 5 is um, 3 or 5 is what I would call extremely draft. <laughs> um, uh, 1 and 2 are not worth even trying, even for tests. So uh, 16 I would normally start with, but I just put in there 25 just because, um, just to, so you can so you can choose. Um, I don't want to kind of put a default too low. Okay. Anyway, moving on. Um, intensity or sorry, a multi light uh, set to intensity mode. Now I did mention this earlier, and again this is set to composite, uh, not separate. Um, let me show you what this really does in Maxwell Render if you don't know already. So this is the test I rendered earlier for the. Um, uh, adjusting the exposure of the uh, background, or oh, sorry, not the background, the floor. And down here I've got my multi light window, and basically what I can do is interactively adjust uh, the intensity of not just the ISO and shutter, which you can actually do in any render uh, up here. That will allow you to adjust the exposure of the uh, entire uh, image. What you can do with multi light enabled is adjust the intensity of each and every single emitter. Now, again, because of the way I've actually uh, set up these emitters, uh, they are quite sensitive, and you know this radial emitter. Again, these are the materials, not the individual objects. Uh, so, if you want kind of individual control, you have to kind of duplicate the material and apply it to the new object. Um, but anyway, yeah, these uh, materials that I've made are quite sensitive. So, this is point two, and it's enough. If I change that to point one, you can see in the preview down here uh, what it's done. Um, but you will need to refresh the preview before you actually see the result in your scene. And again, you know point pop it back up to point 0.2 just so that it's you know, bright enough on this area of the ring. Uh, this is my Dazzler emitter and I can manually, you know, drag and up and down. I don't have to just, uh, I don't have to type in the number and also I can um, use these buttons down here which are solo and mute. So if I want to see what, uh, if I put that back at my value which was uh, 15,000 if I want to see just the effects of the Dazzler emitter, I can press the solo button and there we go and I can refresh the preview and that is the effects of my uh, Dazzler emitter and nothing else. So I can see the effect it's having on my diamond. If I want to see uh, the effect that everything else is having on my diamond, I can mute the Dazzler emitter and refresh the scene and then have a look and basically I want uh, not much apart from the Dazzler emitter, and that's roughly what I'm getting. There is, you know, this uh, gold being reflected in the diamond, which is uh, unfortunate in this image. But you know, in this case, I'm just going to live with it. Um, and that is multi light, and it will add some time to your render time, but not a great deal, to be honest. Nowadays, it doesn't add a lot of time. And if render time is not your main concern, if setup time is your concern and render time doesn't really worry you, then I do recommend just putting it on. Uh, anyway, um, you may as well. It's one of those things where if you get to the end and you should have had multi light on, it's a lot worse than if you put it on and you didn't need it. So that's multi light. And another little pre flight check I want to just go over is devignetting. And devignetting should be enabled at 100%. This is a percentage. And basically, what devignetting does is take out the vignetting, which uh, Maxwell puts into an image by default. And if I uh, pan up to the top there and uh, just refresh my preview. Now this is with devignetting enabled at 100%. When I deactivate devignetting you'll see in the preview uh, the corners get darker basically and that is the vignetting effect. So if I turn it off 
you can see the corners get darker. And if I refresh the scene, the corners get darker in my render. Now to get the pure white background, you definitely want devignetting enabled at 100%. Now remember, the way around it works is that Maxwell by default renders the vignette. You have to enable the devignetting to get rid of it. And I do recommend using devignetting with your jewellery renders because, uh, especially because of the amount of post-processing you're probably going to be doing with them, it's actually easier or be it less realistic to put devignetting back in at a later stage. And anyway, if we're going for a, a white background effect, uh, you actually want to, you know, get rid of the uh, vignette. Um, and again, it's something which uh, you know, photographers work their entire life to get rid of, and we just have to activate a slider. By the way, this uh, devignetting feature is found in Studio down here in the render options. It's in the render options Simulens tab down the bottom and you can enable that 100% before you click render. Uh, you don't have to actually remember to activate it during the well, once the render is finished. One thing that you shouldn't enable in this Simulens window but you should enable once the render is finished is the scattering. Now scattering is again in Maxwell Render down here, here in Simulens and if I enable it and if I just kind of put in a value of 250 which is sort of a ballpark figure uh, you won't see anything in the render or even in the preview but if I click refresh what you'll see is an effect which uh, emulates or simulates the bloom effect which you get in photography and again in photography kind of photographers try and minimize it but here we try and put it in in order to get a little bit of realism uh, especially in you know some jewelry renders where you want that kind of extra sparkle so I'm going to click refresh now and what you'll see is the general public known as bloom should we say and there we go. In this particular render, it hasn't really done a great deal. Um, that's probably the sign of good exposure settings, or at least I hope it is. If you're tempted to go kind of all the way with Simulens, with aperture maps and obstacle maps and diffraction, to be honest, it's not really worth the time, or at least I don't find it worth the time, especially with uh, renders which you know you just want to churn out one by one by one because of the fact that it does require quite a bit of honing down to actually get decent. Um, it's a bit fiddly, whereas with the scattering, you just kind of put it on and put in a value and you're away and I do use 250 as a sort of ballpark figure when I post process the scenes it gets rid of a lot of the bloom effect anyway it's still worth putting it in but just be aware that this you know, this bloom it does reduce the contrast uh, quite a bit uh, so it does get taken out a little bit but I still put it in because obviously if I put it in I could put, just put it in less you know 100 or whatever but then it would get taken out even more. But I mentioned that you shouldn't activate this in Maxwell Studio and wait until the render is finished. This is because if you enable the scattering in Maxwell Studio instead of in Maxwell Render, then what can happen is because of the fact that it will update every few minutes, it updates every sampling level or every 12 minutes in Maxwell Render, and it will update the scattering as well, and that uses up a lot of memory. Um, so don't activate it in Maxwell Studio. Wait until it's finished and then activate it uh, and then refresh your scene and then save the image. Okay, another little uh, pre-rendered check that I just want to uh, bring everyone's attention to is smoothing. Um, this isn't kind of something that uh, has to be done you know, every single time. However, I recently had a, uh, a case where smoothing, I should have checked this and I didn't. Um, and it cost me quite a bit of render test time because I couldn't work out what was going wrong. So anyway, I'm going to go into my perspective mode and then with my diamond selected, go right click it and center selection and focus on my diamond. Basically what was happening is I had my smoothing wrong and my diamond was actually getting smoothed rather than appearing faceted. So in my object parameters, my smoothing is down here and if I, for example, you know, if I turn fire on now and I you know, recalculate my smoothing, my diamond is just going to go really, really wrong, and Maxwell's going to try and smooth all that out, and it's going to take a hell of a long time and into render, and um, it's just going to look wrong. So basically, enable the smoothing at zero, and then recalculate, and that is what you want. Just don't get tripped up, basically. Um, I know I'm talking mainly to a forum of jewellery modelers and that's probably not going to be an issue but I don't know quite how every single plugin works from modeling application to Maxwell Render so just bear in mind if you are getting uh, smoothing problems 
that is where you deal with them. Select the object and then the object parameters. Under appearance, smoothing, set this value, which is the smoothing angle, also known as the fong angle, to eg zero in this case, and then click recalculate. Hopefully that'll help someone and they don't get tripped up like I did. Another pre-rendered check that you will need to check is the sensor resolution, and that's basically the camera resolution or the render resolution that you will end up with. Over here in the camera parameters with the camera selected under the sensor, you can see that I've set it to 1920 by 1080, in other words, full HD. If I want to change that, for example, to 1280 by 720, which is not quite full HD, then with this little lock aspect ratio lock icon enabled, I can simply put 1280 on one side, press enter, and the other side will jump to 720. However, if I then want to, say for example, make this 1280 by 1024, which is still quite a popular uh, computer resolution, then if I put 1024 onto this side, because my aspect ratio is still locked, my other side is going to jump to 1820. So I'm going to put that down to 720, then unlock the aspect ratio, and then put the other side to 1024. Another common mistake I see is um, having the aspect ratio unlocked whenever you're putting in value. So for example, if I try let's say go to try and go to 640 by 480, put 640 in one side, tab over, and then 480 in the other side and return. And what that's done is actually changed the film back. Now the film back is a throwback to photography and this is related to literally the si sensor size of the digital camera or the film size or the film back of a analog camera. And by default this is at 36. And if it's higher or lower than that then it's going to affect your angle of view and you may not get the results you want. So if you get into this kind of sticky situation, lock the aspect ratio and then on the left hand side of the film back pop in 36 and that should get you back to where you are. On a similar note, if I were to just change my view a little bit, let's say I'm zooming into the ring a little bit, you can see that my background is actually getting darker. Now this is because of the way that this background is white of course I've set my sky to constant dome and use the white color but my intensity is 3000 and now because of the fact that my camera is closer to the object despite the fact that the EV hasn't changed the render is lowering in exposure slightly because I'm focused so close so bear in mind that if you change your camera view it is probably worth changing your or at least checking your sky settings for things like this if you've got multi-light enabled in your render options, then this isn't going to be a problem at this stage. But if you don't have multi-light enabled, then just double check it. Another quick word on resolution is to make sure that you're using the correct resolution if you want to print. Now I've done several other videos relating to this, including uh, regarding a test poster to work out the sort of DPI that you want. So make sure you go back and have a look at those videos. Right, ladies and gentlemen, if you have made it this far, I applaud you and we are nearly over and now we just need to have a little look at post-production so here is one of my images in Photoshop and as a reminder this image is using the example scene um, so you know this uh, right reflection here is coming from the emitter on the right and this is coming from the emitter on the left and the dazzle is coming from the dazzler this image does have devignetting enabled. I just, this is just my naming that I use. So I know that this image does have devignetting enabled at 100%, and also my scattering is at 250. I have included in my little download a file called James Coleman Photoshop Action Basic Jewelry Adjustment Layers. And basically, all you have to do is double click it, and that will automatically install it in Photoshop for you, and it will come up in here. And basically what this is going to do is just make a couple of adjustment layers and as you can see I will play it now and it's nice and quick and uh, if I hide and unhide what it's done is basically it's just added in a tiny little bit of contrast as well as added a slight basically this um, photo filter here is adding in a slight not orange but kind of yeah, just a little bit of warmth it's just that you know that little little touch that little something and the curves are again basically adding just a tiny tiny bit of uh, contrast um this is you know basically this isn't the be all and end all of post production this is just a, a little something just to help you get started um and hopefully you know it it does make a little bit well it does make a little bit of difference and um Hopefully it's a good starting point to kind of uh, continue onwards. 
And speaking of moving forward from this kind of starting point, one of my favorite uh, plugins to use for post-production is a plugin made by a company called Alien Skin, and they make a plugin called Exposure. What I'm going to do is hide my adjustment layers and select my original background layer, and then go to Filter, Alien Skin Exposure. And basically, Alien Skin Exposure contains uh, loads of different filters which um, kind of just help emulate film and a lot of them are kind of ridiculous <laughs> um, for getting a realistic render you know for example these ones here they're kind of Instagram you know then they're not worth using however some of the more subtle ones uh, for example these color films print they are you know just enough to kind of bring out that little bit of realism which you just lose when you're rendering um, and they are definitely worth it. Fair enough obviously you know you can go all the way and you know, do whatever you want with these mad crazy layers and of course you do have these fine controls over here to kind of uh, fine-tune it a little bit more or to make it as subtle as you want. Um, so you know I'm not going to go in depth into exposure but um, that's one of my favorite plugins for adding in just a little hint of realism. If you're not going to go down that road, and even if you're not going to go down the road of, you know, uh, with this plugin script, uh, sorry, not plugin script, action script, if you're not going to go down that road, then please at least do something with the contrast. I mentioned this earlier. Um, image auto contrast is sort of the least you should do. This is due to the way Max Render works. Basically, it, it, something about linear contrast, etc., etc. It needs contrast to be increased, whatever you do, um, especially when you're using scattering, which obviously I have. So, uh, image auto contrast is sort of the least you should do. Um, ideally, you know, what you would do is have a uh, curves, maybe auto curves, um, and kind of just increase that uh, contrast just a little bit, and you know maybe do something else um, with it besides. But just do something with the contrast. It is the least you should do, and basically, uh, by default, you know your images will not be accurate. End of story, unless you increase the contrast. Uh, that is what it comes down to. Um, obviously, you know with Photoshop, if you do have a lot of images to get through, you can go to File, um, either Automate Batch or Scripts Image Processor, and kind of just do loads. Um, but please, please, please do something because I see so many nice renders where it just you know the contrast just isn't high enough um, and you know please please do something with the contrast um, and of course one final reminder if the, this image um, didn't use the um, alpha layer trick to get a white background this background is rendered using the uh, sky dome trick which is by default in the example scene but if I had used my alpha trick don't forget that you do need to go to uh, layer matting and remove black matte it's greyed out here because it's not matting um, but just remember that you need to do that if you have used that alpha mask not alpha mask trick but alpha layer trick right so that is that um, thank you very much for reaching the end in conclusion sort of as, as a Reminder, this folder will be zipped and uploaded to SkyDrive where you can download it and um, use it uh, with the action, uh, double click it to open up in Photoshop and uh, if you put it inside Maxwell 2.7 library then this folder will be here in your um, in your library when you go to file, in studio file, um, library, James Coleman set up components and the idea is that you can drag and drop into your uh, scenes and kind of build it up step by step. As a reminder, you know, if you, you open any of these and it asks you, oh, you know, this texture is broken, the textures are there as well, um, and uh, there's an example set up. So what I would do if you're um, working with these setups is to import them and scale them as necessary again the axis are on the center of the object so you can adjust the uh, axis not just the width of the you know these um of these uh, cylinder arcs as they are but also um the height and depth uh, independently 
and the idea is that you kind of get the nice setup that works and then save it in the same folder and then you can just use it in the library like you did before and again the workflow would be to open this uh, either the example setup or your own setups and then to import your own rings or geometry or objects or jewelry whatever and the reason to do you know the reason you do that is because only the file that you open in the first place is what will uh, maxwell will, will remember the render options and the environment. If you import um, objects into it then it only remembers the camera and the objects and the materials. It, it kind of ignores the render options and the environment options of whatever you're importing. And another reminder that if you import um, some of these objects into some other objects and it kind of says uh, by the way you've got the same material what do you want to do? You can ignore the new one. Ignore the new one because it is exactly the same I promise you. And so my thanks to Eric Marvitz, who uh, challenged me to do this. Um, I think what I've come up with does work. Um, and certainly uh, what I'm going to do is kind of you know stick with this and to just uh, do some more um, uh, example setups and probably uh, post them uh, onto... Or not, not to post them particularly, but actually just uh, include them into the folder and just update it on the fly and I'll post an update of uh, whenever this is updated uh, with the date stamp of when and if it is updated and uh, I hope that 3dcadjewelry.com enjoys it um, if you do enjoy it and you do use it and it does bring you success I would adore a PayPal donation to j.coleman3 at uni.brighton.ac.uk um, you know, I do this for the love of Maxwell Render and for the love of no one else does it and <laughs> um, I don't really see any profit personally out of this and I know that a lot of people, you know, make images for a lot of money um, and people like me don't get any of it. That's very sad. Um, um, so, you know, I would adore a PayPal donation to j.com3 at uni.brighton.ac.uk but I would ask that if you want to contact me with a question or anything, then use my other email address of maxwellrenderbrightoncdt at gmail.com and, of course, my Twitter handle of at jcon underscore design. And don't forget as well that I will, you know, if all else fails and you need something done uh, that needs a little bit of more care and attention, I will quite happily uh, do it for you, basically, um, if you want. I will be happy to you know, take on projects still. However, on that note, I am trying to mm, reduce, is the word I should use, reduce the amount of work that I'm doing uh, for Maxwell Render tutorials. Um, I'm trying to concentrate on my product design work. So in other words, I may not be able to help teach you um, uh, what to do, but I will be quite happy to do it for you. Um, it's faster. And of course, um, you know, this will still be constantly updated. And uh, if you do run into trouble, I'm not going to entirely ignore you if you need help. Um, but I just uh, don't want to do it for my main job. So uh, it might take a while to get a, an appointment with me or whatever. I think, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end. Thank you for watching. I might see you again soon. I might not. Take care.